Good evening, everybody. I'm, te I'm, t I'm uh, tempted to start out by saying it was a dark and stormy night, <laughs> but uh, I won't do that. <coughs> uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, the host for tonight's program. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. So yes, uh, even with masks on, and it's important that we're masked and following all of Plymouth Church's uh, and the CDC's uh, guidelines, it's very good to see you all here and uh, welcome us back uh, together. It's important as we gather to acknowledge that we do so on the traditional land of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Delaware tribes. And we pray that what we do here uh, will honor them and those present among us today. It's also important for us to thank Plymouth Church for hosting us uh, from our very beginning, uh, more than 16 years ago, uh, even before we were a 501c3 in 2005, our first program was here in 2001 in this room with 12 people. Um, from our very beginning, Plymouth has not only been our host, but a real partner in every sense in our work of justice. So we thank Plymouth and the pastors and uh, the people of Plymouth Church. And we're glad that our friends, friends of the third world, uh, Jim and Marion, are here. Uh, so, okay. You know, I was uh, reminding Lucas, uh, Quentin was reminding Lucas that, he, Quentin, you met Lucas in 2006, you said. I, I've known Lucas and his family since 1998 when I was living in Amman, Jordan, and I met Lucas's dad, Zugby Zugby, there. And like any good Bethlehemite, Zugby said, come and see. And I went and saw uh, uh, and met Lucas and his family in Bethlehem, and I've been back more than 30 times since then. And I say this often, but it's heartfelt, Lucas. Um, um, without Zugby and his wife Elaine, who's from South Bend and who attended Manchester College, Lucas attended Manchester University. Without you and your brothers and sister, there wouldn't be an Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and we wouldn't be here tonight. So I'm just always really grateful to you, Lucas, and to your family uh, for my life's work, really, since uh, 1998. Lucas and I collaborated together on projects when he was at Manchester University. You've read the introductory material about Lucas's PhD work at Michigan State on trauma and Palestinian women, children, youth, and political prisoners and their coping and resistance strategies. And I'll let him tell you more about that work uh, in his presentation. The only thing I'll add before I turn it over to you, Lucas, is that we've hosted your dad here in this room on more than one occasion. We've hosted your mom and Marcel, your sister, here in this room. Uh, we've raised money for We Am uh, as, as one of our first uh, and most important mission partners uh, from our, our beginning 16 years ago. So your family does. Your, your family does. And we love you. We love your family. And we're really delighted to have you and your wife, Jessica, uh, married now two and a half years uh, uh, with us tonight. So, Lucas, welcome. Whew, what an honor. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, and I, I have to say, yes, uh, you know, really, Michael is family. Uh, and I, we were, I was telling him this evening, how uh, it really felt like he was always there during my childhood. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's a great thing. Um, and, and after, when I came to the US to study at Manchester University, he was also there and, and really uh, grateful for your presence in our lives. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for coming and uh, thank you for inviting me um, to Michael and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, right? Um, Today, I'm, I'm going to be talking about some difficult things. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Michigan State University um, with, 
you know, interest in Palestine. As a Palestinian, I'm, I'm really invested in a just and peace, peaceful solution um, in Palestine, and I want to be able to live with my family, um, my wife and, and extended family and friends in a way that, you know, respects our dignity. So that's really at the core of all this work. Um, to start off, let's see. Yep, all right, it's okay. Um, you know, there will be some disturbing things brought up in this presentation. And so I want to warn you ahead of time <laughs> and, uh, and encourage you to take care of yourself. Um, you know, if, if you need to step away, um, I won't be offended if I see everybody like walking out. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but, but really do take, uh, take that um, seriously. And I, was, I, I think in, in my work looking at political prisoners, uh, it's been really difficult. Right, it's, it's very personal to me, um, and, and, and I, although I have not been imprisoned, fortunately, right, um, I guess yet, you know, with the, with the proportions, we'll see, but, um, you know, family and friends have been deeply impacted. And so this is very personal work and also really important stuff, um, but also really difficult. So to start off, um, can I just ask, how many folks have seen this and maybe know what this image is starting? Okay, well that's great. I love to share it. Um, this is a spoken word by a Palestinian named Rafif Ziada. And this poem is called We Teach Life, Sir. Um, and it's a really iconic poem in the Palestinian struggle. Um, a reminder that, you know, with everything going on, all the things, the horrible things that happen, there's still joy, there's life. And, and it's hard sometimes to focus on that when it's so important for us to highlight the injustices that we experience. So we'll, we'll start off with this and then kind of move from there. I'll start with this poem. I wrote this poem when the bombs were dropping on Gaza and I was the media spokesperson for the coalition uh, doing a lot of the organizing and we had stayed up to about six o'clock in the morning perfecting every sound bite and by the end, if you're Palestinian, you know most Palestinians get tired and start pronouncing our P's as B's so we become Palestinians by the end of the day so I was practicing my P's all night and the next morning um, one of the journalists asked me don't you think it would all be fine if you just stopped teaching your children to hate? Um, I did not insult the person, I was very polite, uh, but I wrote this poem uh, as a response to these types of questions we Palestinians always get. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits filled enough with statistics to counter measured response. And I perfected my English and I learned my UN resolutions. But still, he asked me, Ms. Ziada, don't you think everything would be resolved if you would just stop teaching so much hatred to your children? Pause. I look inside of me for strength to be patient, but patience is not at the tip of my tongue as the bombs drop over Gaza. Patience has just escaped me. Pause. Smile. We teach life, sir. Rafif, remember to smile. Pause. We teach life, sir. We, Palestinians, teach life after they have occupied the last sky. We teach life after they have built their settlements and apartheid walls. After the last skies, we teach life, sir. But today, my body was a TV'd massacre made to fit into sound bites and word limits. And just give us a story, a human story. You see, this is not political. We just want to tell people about you and your people. So give us a human story. Don't mention that word apartheid and occupation. This is not political. You have to help me as a journalist to help you tell your story, which is not a political story. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre. How about you give us a story of a woman 
in and Gaza who needs medication. How about you? Do you have enough bone broken limbs to cover the sun? Hand me over your dead and give me the list of their names in 1,200 word limits. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre made to fit into sound bites and word limits and move those that are desensitized to terrorist blood. But they felt sorry. They felt sorry for the cattle over Gaza. So I give them UN resolutions and statistics and we condemn and we deplore and we reject and these are not two equal sides, occupier and occupied, and a hundred dead, two hundred dead, and a thousand dead. And between that war crime and massacre, I vent out words and smile, not exotic, smile, not terrorist. And I recount, I recount, a hundred dead, two hundred dead, a thousand dead. Is anyone out there? Will anyone listen? I wish I could wail over their bodies. I wish I could just run barefoot in every refugee camp and hold every child, cover their ears so they wouldn't have to hear the sound of bombing for the rest of their life the way I do. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre. And let me just tell you, there is nothing your UN resolutions have ever done about this. And no soundbite, no soundbite I come up with no matter how good my English gets. No soundbite, no soundbite, no soundbite, no soundbite will bring them back to life. No soundbite will fix this. We teach life, sir. We teach life, sir. We Palestinians wake up every morning to teach the rest of the world life, sir. <laughs> quite the powerful poem, and quite true. And so I like to start with that often as a reminder that there is life, right? The other thing, so today's talk, I wanted to talk about trauma in general, and then also specifically about political imprisonment as one form of trauma Palestinians are subjected to. This here, this next video is from a resident of Deir Yassin, um, a village that was uh, massacred in 1948. And uh, you know, I could tell you, but I think it's, it's more powerful to hear from someone who lived through it. Um, and then uh, I do want to share afterwards a little bit about um, some foundational trauma research around inter intergenerational trauma. <laughs> أنا كنت عمري ثمان سنين كان الساعة خمسة كنا نايمين دخلوا على البيت ورش أبوي قتلوا أمي راحت أسيرة جبت أخوي و ومشيت من السرير ورحنا مع جيراننا هربنا واحنا مهاربين على عين كارم في اللي سيد عمره سبعين سنة كان مقتول ومرمي في الأرض أثرت فيها سيدي أبو أبوي وقتلوا جميع الناس منهم خالي أخو أمي كان عمره ثلاثين سنة أطلعوهم من البيت وصفوهم كلهم صف واحد للصهاينة ورشوها عمة حرقوها هي وولادة حرقوها في البيت تكون الحياة يعني مش شكل صعوبة ولحد الآن ولا أزال أذكر دي الياسين نحن زرنا الدار أنا وبنتي وبناتها رقطة لوز منها Our house was beautiful Back in 1930s, it was a two-story. Dariusin was known for its uh, pure air, and it was high up in the mountains, so it has this very serene type of environment. Oh my God. I 
فكرت كثير ابونا بكيتي كان يقعد ويحط هالأرجيلة ويقعد على البرندا كان يقعد عليها ويأرجل طبعا البيت أثر فيا كثير البيت تذكرته يعني كل إشي بتذكره فيش صعوبة يعني كانت نروح على المدرسة ونيجي مع أحلاك أي أنا Hi Zena. Data describes the story, how she recounts it. She does it without any kind of hatred in her heart. So, for someone who lost so much from there, it's interesting to see that she doesn't have intolerance of people that were intolerant to her. There's a lot of suffering, but there's also a lot of hope and resilience that's there too. I'm definitely gonna go back, and I always tell my kids, I'm gonna be that ship that anchors in the sea and hopefully I will bring them there. I'm gonna do everything in my power to get some of the land back. It'll be multi-generational, go for years. Allah, if you tell me that the land is in the land, Allah, the first thing is in the land of the land. Can I ask, who was familiar with the story of Dir Yassin beforehand? Okay, great. So Dir Yassin is one of 33 villages that experienced a massacre during 1948. 33. And during that same time, more than 400 villages were completely erased, right? And so I'm sure many of you have seen this map here showing the loss of land since 1918 on this far left corner, far left side, to 2015 on the right side. And what this map represents isn't just the change of ownership over land, it, it represents ethnic cleansing. And recently, there's been some uh, fairly exciting research on trauma, specifically intergenerational trauma. Uh, there's one foundational study where they brought mice, a generation of mice. And they had them smell cherry blossom while also being electrocuted, a trauma. And eventually, th this generation of mice began responding to the cherry blossom smell on its own as if they were being hurt. Well, then what they did is they bred the mice, second generation, no exposure to the cherry blossom smell or electrocution. Third generation, so the grandkids of the first mice, they just shit, you know, had them exposed to the cherry blossom smell without them being exposed in the past. And their response was that of pain, right? And this is, this is pretty impactful because, you know, they were able to recognize how trauma changes the DNA and changes the way the DNA is read by future generations, right? And, and what's amazing is folks have been recognizing the impacts of intergenerational trauma long before they could actually do research that proves it, right? They, and now they're able to trace all sorts of things and neuropsychology is really quite the development. And so in Palestine, you know, I wanted to show, I, I know many of you are aware of the Nakba, but it, I think it's important to remind ourselves that that's, that's the past traumas that the generations in Palestine today are still struggling with, right? Take away the occupation, take everything away, and there's still that challenge. And so, you know, in spite, so we've experienced this trauma, this historical trauma, and it's gone through generations, and it has just continued. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine is ongoing, you know, and, and we had, you know, the recent example of Sheikh Jarrah, right? So this is pretty astounding. Like, how do you respond to something like this, right? It's very difficult. And then beyond that, I'd like to share some of the trauma that the current generation may have been exposed to. So this here is data from a study of 3,400 students in Ramallah, 10th and 11th graders. And I'm hoping you can, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but um, I've highlighted in red 
some significant numbers. At the top is 15% of these 10th and 11th graders had experienced being beaten by the Israeli army. 17% had been detained. Almost 5% had been tortured. And I want to say this again. This is a representative sample of 10th and 11th graders. And almost 5% had been tortured. 60% had, ex has, had been exposed to tear gas. 80% saw shootings. 28% saw a stranger being killed. And 11% saw a friend or neighbor being killed. So when you, when you see these things, these numbers, the, this, this level of exposure to direct violence and trauma, it's, it's difficult, it's, it's unbelievable and amazing that so many Palestinians continue to pursue their education, continue through higher education. And that's where the life is, right? And still people can experience joy. Another form of trauma is home demolitions. And since 1967, there have been more than 48,000 structures demolished. And when a seven-story building with 20 housing units is, destro is destroyed, that it only counts as one structure. Okay? And this relates to imprisonment, as for a long time, one of the punishments for those who have been imp imprisoned and politically, uh, political prisoners is to abolish the family's home, right? And that was part of, excuse me, that was part of the interrogation tactics that was objected to. Although Israel says they no longer uh, engage in that type of, uh, that type of, you know, threatening and, and demol demolishing homes as a form of collective punishment, there are still many, many homes that continue to be demolished. And although the tactics, they have changed, right? In Sheikh Jarrah, there were false claims of um, deeds, right? Uh, claiming that this home was owned by certain entities. So again, uh, I do want to share this trigger warning. Um, now is the point in the presentation where I'll talk about political imprisonment specifically. Um, and, you know, this is some really difficult, right, really dark, um, frankly, some of the, some, you know, this is the worst side of humanity. This is Amir. Amir is my friend. Um, we grew up in Bethlehem together. And Amir is, uh, was a student at Birzeit studying mechanical engineering. And on the 10th of September in 2019, at 1 a.m., the Israeli occupation forces raided Amir's dorm room in Birzeit. After breaking through the door, they used dogs to attack him, after which they beat him, cuffed and blindfolded him. They threw him onto the floor of the military jeep. And during transfer, the soldiers continued to kick him and beat him. When they arrived, they treated the wounds that they had just given him. And then after they treated those wounds, they blindfolded him again and transferred him again before sending him to offer prison. And during the entire transfer, they continued to beat him with their rifles. Finally, they transferred him to Al Muskubiyya in Jerusalem. It's an interrogation center. And he was tortured for f almost 50 days there. Amir was sentenced to 16 months in prison. He was arrested on the 10th of September, but charged on the 3rd of November. 50 days after they got through with their interrogation. The charge was that Amir was a part of 
the progressive student front, an unlawful association, according to the Israeli military. They attended meetings and participated in student activities organized by the student group at Birzeit University. That means Amir was arrested, beaten, and tortured because of his involvement in a university organization, a student organization. And this was lawful under Israeli military courts. I think this is you know, one of the things that really highlights the absurdity of the occupation. And I, I decided not to share about the specific torture that Amir was subjected to. Um, but I will talk in general about prisoners. But before we get to that, there are currently more than 4,600 4, Palestinian political prisoners. And more than 800,000 have been detained since 1967. That means an estimated 40% of the adult male Palestinian population has been imprisoned at some point in their life. Let me say that again. 40% of the adult male Palestinian population had been imprisoned at some point in their life. And then more than 10,000 female prisoners since 1967. More than 15,000 Palestinian children have been detained since the year 2000. And Israel is one of the only countries in the world that practices administrative detention on children. And administrative detention in Israel means they can arrest any Palestinian and hold them for three months without charge, without any accusation of a crime, and hold them indefinitely. Right? And often their imprisonment and arrest includes torture. Currently, there are around 500 administrative detainees. That means 500 people are in prison without having access to any sort of civil process. Right? They don't have civil rights, and they don't even know what they're being accused of. Of prisoners released from Israeli prisons in 2018, 70% were between the ages of 18 and 30, 70%. That means the majority of Palestinian political prisoners are young people, right? In formative years of their lives. The majority of prisoners are subjected to torture, right? And in terms of sample sizes and various research studies, the numbers vary between, you know, mid upper 50% to 93% of those that they sample having experienced torture. And there are more than 100 documented torture techniques, including beating, stress positions, sleep and other sensory deprivation, isolation, solitary confinement, sexual assault, and threats against lives of relatives. And on uh, the right here, you see an image of one of the stress positions that Palestinians are subjected to during interrogation. It's called the banana position, where they shackle their arms to their legs and arching their back in a way that is extremely painful and can cause permanent disability. Between 1967 and 2007, 220 prisoners have died in imprisonment. 53 have died due to medical negligence and 72 died during torture, or because of torture. For children, they have no right to due process, and they may not even see an attorney for up to 90 days. The court documents are often in Hebrew, and they're held in Israel, making it very difficult for family to visit, and a violation of international law. Palestinian, Palestinian children have been categorized up until around 2010 as children up until the age of 12. 
as juvenile 12 to 14, young adult when they're between 14 and 16 years old, and adults when they are 16. And part of the argument and framing as apartheid is because of this different law, right? Palestinians are subjected to different laws than Israelis. Israeli children get to be children until they're 18 years old. Whereas you can see, Palestinian children up until 2010 were only allowed to be children until the age of 12. And although they changed it to uh, now allowing children to be children until 16, they still engage in the arresting of these children and, and in the interrogation, including torture, of these children. So for child prisoners, 73% experienced physical violence. More than 85% were blindfolded and had their hands tied. 64% were subjected to verbal abuse. 20% were subjected to stress positions, such as the banana position that I showed you a couple slides ago. And 49% were detained from their homes in the middle of the night. And this is particularly strategic, right? Going into someone's home where you typically feel safe and realizing in the middle of the night, you're not safe in your own home. And so unsurprisingly, many of these children, after release for months, possibly years, struggle to sleep, right? Because any night could be the next time they get arrested. And the other point is that they could arrest these children at any point, right? They always have access to the West Bank. We are under occupation. They can cut off movement any time. And they do raid very frequently, different times of the day. And so I can't think of a reason that they would raid at night other than to intentionally cause that harm. 74% of the children weren't aware of their rights and informed. 96% were interrogated without the presence of a family member. And 49% were coerced into signing documents in Hebrew, a language most don't understand. Right? So I, wanna, I, wanna, I really want to emphasize this. These are children, 12 to 17 years old, being kidnapped by a military, and then interrogated, abused, and then forced to sign documents in Hebrew, which were often admitting guilt, right? And this is all legal in Israeli military courts because of the dual system, right? Palestinians, we don't get civil rights. Many of you have children or grandchildren, and I, for one, can't imagine what it would be like to have to make a decision in that situation. As you'd expect, all these things, everything going on, everything we are subjected to because of the occupation and the siege, the continued ethnic cleansing, it has an impact. 
and here are rates of suicidal ideation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. For children 12 and under, 30 and 26 percent. For children 15 and over, 26 and 31 percent. So that means this large, almost a third of the children have had thoughts and considered suicide. So for female prisoners who have been engaged in the struggle for resistance, the struggle for liberation, excuse me, since the early 1900s, right? In the 1930s, we had a, uh, a pretty large women's conference in which women were organizing and strategizing on how to ensure Palestinian liberation. And, and that engagement in the struggle has continued. And female prisoners are subjected to the same types of torture that male prisoners are subjected to, in addition to threats of and perpetrated rape, forced stripping, threatening to spread rumors of sexual promiscuity, forced to, to wear uniforms that would be culturally taboo, assault and specifically hitting the belly of pregnant women, and medical negligence and lack of access to menstrual products. And some of these women that have been imprisoned have had their homes demolished as part of their interrogation, as part of the threats, as part of the punishment. And I, as I prepared for this talk, you know, there are too many stories of torture, specifically sexual torture against Palestinian women. And I decided that I wouldn't share the specifics. Um, you know, and I, and I think, I think it's, it's really difficult to learn about these things, to think about these things. And I hope that you, you know, we recognize the challenges, right? And I hope instead of feeling hopeless or you know, just depleted at the immenseness and at the, at the unbelievable amount of trauma that we're talking about, you know, I hope we are moved to action. Just as the prisoners engaged in resistance within the prisons. You know, if you think about this, in a place where literally every aspect of their day in life is controlled, Palestinian political prisoners were able to creatively resist. And those include hunger strikes. And the first documented hunger strike in Palestinian, by Palestinian prisoners started on February 18th in 1968. And one of the primary, excuse me, oh, one of the primary demands was that Palestinian prisoners no longer be required to call their Israeli captors my lord, or Yazidi in Arabic. Beyond that, these hunger strikes have also achieved the ability to demand blankets, food, books, agency, dignity, and power. And one of the most recent examples is Mahir al-Akhras, who spent 103 days on hunger strike and was able to be liberated, right? He demanded his freedom because he was being held as an administrative detainee. Organized education system. This is uh, one really like very common known fact, is that when you go to prison, you're going to get educated, right? That's how, that's how it worked. They, they developed a organized education system. And uh, Mais Abu Ghosh, who was imprisoned with uh, Amir, who I talked about earlier, she talked about how in the women's prison, Khaled Ajarrar, who is a member of the Legislative Council, actually like created a routine. <laughs> so in the morning, they would start with exercise, and then they'd have lectures, and then everybody would work on their homework, and you know, and, and really amazing within this particularly repressive area, within the prison, actually creating and learning and creating knowledge. And so the production of knowledge included writing novels and essays and then smuggling them out. And Angela Davis uh, often talks about how she received a letter when she was imprisoned in the US. She received a letter 
from Palestinian prisoners in Palace, uh, while well, being held in Israeli prisons, where you know many of the prisoners had signed a solidarity statement, and they smuggled that out of the prison into the West Bank, and then from the West Bank, someone brought it to the U.S., and then someone smuggled it into Angela Davis, right? This, uh, <laughs> this is amazing. That, that is really amazing and inspiring for me. Non-compliance, communication with outside media, family and lawyers. Oftentimes when uh, Palestinian prisoners are subjected to torture, they, there's a gag order, right? They're not allowed to share the details. And so resisting that and violating the gag, or, the gag order can land them back in prison and back into a similar situation and, and has real consequences. And so in spite of that, Palestinian prisoners are, are sharing. They're talking, they're making it heard, making their voices heard and, and sharing about their experiences. And then the final note on here is Sumud. And Sumud is steadfastness. You know, and Sumud is such a powerful word in Arabic. It, it, it really moves me to the core. And one example of Sumur was a female prisoner who was prepared for the threats of rape. When the interrogator made the threat, she took off her shirt and defiantly challenged the captor, do it, <laughs> right? And the interrogator was just, he didn't know what to do. And so in the end, she was just returned to herself, right? It's a very small victory in a really horrible place. But I think it's amazing, the creativity. You know, and, and there are tons of these examples of people really creatively engaging in resistance. And, and another one is using a radio and, and um, transmitting a radio, radio frequency for the prisoners to be updated on what's going on in their lives and in the world and things because they're often isolated, right? And, that, and that's illegal. <laughs> and if, if the folks who are uh, hosting this radio are caught, they will have some very serious consequences. But still, they resist. And I think about this resistance, and I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure how this fell. <laughs> Hopefully, you, you can still hear me. Right? If Palestinian prisoners can resist in the most difficult situation and oftentimes the most traumatizing experience in their lives, then I think we can do a thing or two, too. You know, and, and many of you know my father, who has been in prison multiple times. And uh, one of my favorite stories is, uh, you know, during one imprisonment, he was showing around uh, some folks from Manchester's Peace Studies program. Uh, Y'all may know Katie Gray Brown's father. And, uh, and they violated a curfew that the Israelis put on, right? Like probably like 5 p.m., you have to go home. And so they arrested my father and detained the students and Professor Brown. And then eventually, I think they deported the students and uh, my father was still imprisoned. But once uh, Professor Brown came back to the US, organized a letter writing campaign in which they demanded the release of Zugbi Zugbi, right? It's so nice you say it twice, my father. And after, uh, you know, my father says after they received like, I don't know how many hundreds of letters at the, you know, the Israeli commander at the prison came to my father and, and began asking like questions of like, you know, who are these people? Why are they sending all this? You know, if we let you go, can they stop? And, uh, and he was released, right? Um, and, and really, <laughs> you know, a letter, just a letter. I think that, that's some pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And so again, as a reminder, I think we'll get to questions now, but um, you know, there are things we can do and there is life and there's joy. And for those who haven't been to Palestine, I hope you can join Michael and visit us. It's a really great experience. So I think uh, that's all for today. I, I do have a song that if it's all right, I'll just play in the background while, while we talk. And this is the video in which uh, uh, this is a really very cool um, example of some of the art and creativity that comes out of Palestine in spite of everything. Um, and you may see, many of you may know Tariq, uh, my brother. Um, he is in this video. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, thank you.
Should I turn it down a little more? It's okay, yeah. <laughs> maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit down. Down a little bit more. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, it, it felt odd to applaud that, but uh, the applause was <laughs> gratitude for you being here with us, Lucas. Um, we have time for some questions from you all. Uh, Zugby always said that he, he's been ar arrested 18 times. And that, that's, one of the more, that's one of the stories he always tells about Ken Brown and him uh, with students. Uh, questions, folks? Yeah, Victoria, please. Victoria, why don't you stand up and, and re just take your mask off while you speak so we can all hear. I would be surprised if there were anyone from the West Bank who hasn't experienced tear gas. Um, sadly, you know, at, at WM, uh, we'd say tear gas is, is our perfume. It's our cologne, right? Um, and uh, yeah, sadly, uh, it's, it's uh, used widely and, and freely. Very, uh, <laughs> they're very generous in their tear gas uh, allotments, I'd say. But yeah, I think, yeah, I guess the, the answer is yes. Uh, too many stories to count, um, but I will say uh, tear gas targets similar nerve endings as diabetes, and, uh, and there's discussion of whether there's a relation. There's, there's a really high uh, prevalence of diabetes within Palestine, you know, almost to the point that as a Palestinian, you just assume, yeah, we're going to have diabetes at some point in our life, right? And that's kind of the joke is like, oh, are you at that age yet? Um, but, you know, and I, th and, and I think there's still a lot of research to, to examine what the long-term effects are, right? It's, it's, it's marketed as a non-lethal weapon, yet a number of people have died from suffocation, right? But yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. It is available. Um, you know, there's, uh, as in the US, there's a stigma against it. Um, but I think part of the challenge for practitioners is how do you address a trauma that's ongoing, right? You know, if, if someone comes in and, and they're struggling because every time they go through the checkpoint, they're having a panic attack because they're often targeted or harassed. Maybe they were a larger build or the way they look or whatever, right? How do you, how do you address that? effectively when it's ongoing, right? You still have to go through the checkpoint. And maybe desensitizing to some of that, um, right? EMDR might be helpful, but I think, um, I think it's a challenge, you know? And, and I think part of the critique and challenge or kind of the response to some of that is, is they don't want to normalize it, right? We don't want to be normalized to the impacts of occupation. We want the occupation to end. There, there's a dearth of mental health professionals, right? 
mm-hmm. throughout uh, West Bank and Gaza. Mm-hmm. So there's uh, access to mental health uh, professionals. It's, it's not easy to, to uh, find someone. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think a part of it is also thinking about the culture, right? Uh, I think in the U.S. for clinicians, you know, you're often not supposed to have uh, another type of relationship with the clients. And, and when it's clan-based, right, uh, my wife is a clinical social worker, and, and we were talking today about, like, what is she going to do in Palestine when everyone she sees is going to be somehow related to her or our family or, you know, there, there are relations and that's part of the foundation of our society. And so thinking about what alternatives do we need to engage with. Um, and so, but yes, also, you know, uh, you know, I think part of it is like fear maybe like, you know, what is confidentiality when everybody knows everybody else's business? <laughs> um, but it is also very difficult, right? And so, you know, that's something... Um, I think Jessica hopefully will uh, will be joining and working on. And there are new institutions that are starting. Um, for example, in Bethlehem, there's a place called the Psychology Spa, which focuses less on individual therapy and more on like preventative care. Um, and so there, yeah, there are a number of approaches that are being used, um, but it's still also difficult to access, especially considering you know financially. How do you fund these centers? when the people that need the support might not have access to capital. So for example, um, 2.4 million about in Gaza. How many mental health professionals? I, I read somewhere there's maybe one or two psychiatrists. And mm-hmm. How many counselors? Yeah. In Gaza? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know the number in Gaza of counselors, um, but definitely not enough. I heard it was less than 20. Yep, I, I think that would be very accurate. 20, I think from the Palestine Health Ministry. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sorry, yes. Uh, Cher, and then Linda. Sorry, we were at the Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, I have a friend who was imprisoned when he was 15, and he was arrested for six months. I think three months of it was torture, and uh, and being released. Uh, right, it, he was afraid to tell people that he was in prison because anytime he go through goes through a checkpoint, the soldiers sometimes like remind him, "Oh, you know, we might get you back sometime soon." Right. And, and also, like, couldn't sleep year out, right? Like, a year later, um, he was still having nightmares, waking up screaming, right? But, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Yep. Yep, exactly. They're forced to sign often documents in Hebrew. And, and they don't know what's, what it says, but it's often they say, like, that's what will get them to stop hitting you or cursing at you or harassing you or whatever. And so as a kid, of course, anything to stop the abuse, right? And for those that do not know, you Mm. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Cher. Yeah, Linda, please. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I think uh, I will say 
a big part of it is growing up in Palestine. Oftentimes, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's a phrase like you hear all the time, is if you want to resist the occupation, get educated. Continue your studies, and then you can do something. The other thing I'd say is it's a form of resistance, right? Um, for up until, I think, 19, the early 1990s, Israel controlled every aspect of our education system in the West Bank. They decided who to hire, who to fire, when school was in, when school was out, right? There were, I think, over 30 textbooks that were banned, right, because they discussed Palestinian history or things like that. Um, and oftentimes, if the unions weren't even allowed, and so Palestinians who were thought to engage in anything that Israel didn't want, including organizing a teacher's union, uh, they were fired, arrested, or forced uh, into early retirement. And so I think because of that, what does that span? That's, you know, 30, 30, almost 30 years where our education system was completely controlled by the Israeli occupation. And, and during the first intifada, many of you are probably aware that they closed many of the schools and universities for years. And so I think part of our response as a society to being not allowed to achieve our education, to actually go to school, to learn, to engage, and to control what we're learning, um, I think has led to that real motivation to, to embrace it when, when it's available. Sometimes we met with Bassem Tamimi and his family in their homes. Mm -hmm. And both of them have made a conscious choice that seems odd to us, but they've made a conscious choice to put children, youth, and women in the front of their Friday demonstrations and protests mm -hmm. to confront the Israeli military. And when we ask them about that, because of course we're kind of surprised <laughs> by this, they say that well, they do that because, and, and it's been borne out now with studies, I want you to talk about studies by universities and other folks in the U.S. and others in Europe, in the EU, that these young people, children, and women what, are, are, are healthier mm -hmm. uh, because they've been able to channel yep. their anger or frustration. Talk, talk a little bit yeah. about, yeah. about women and children in the front lines of Absolutely. There is a tie between resilience and resistance, right? Engaging and actively believing that we can influence our environment and our lives, it leads to better outcomes. And so Palestinians who engage in resistance tend to be better off in many ways, including mental health, right? Lower PTSD symptoms, right? Um, oftentimes, more access to community and feelings of belonging, right? And, and having hope is a big part of that. So I, I, so I think it is, it's, it's absolutely true, right? And oftentimes you might hear, you know, in some studies uh, they discuss how youth who have not engaged in organized resistance or, you know, going to a demonstration, you know, feeling like down, feeling like something's wrong, right? Because the alternative is to resign and give up. And that's not healthy. And that is not an option, right? So I, I think, you know, I don't know how much to say more about it, but it really is. And, and actually right now, one of the things I'm working on is ex looking at the relationship between critical consciousness and resilience. And, and, you know, it's interesting that we're finding that for folks of marginalized identities and marginalized backgrounds, there is a positive correlation. And so that, you know, like critical consciousness, uh, like, you know, kind of, how do I define critical consciousness? It's like understanding their environment and their experiences, like through a political kind of understanding, like their systems of oppression that impact us, that has been associated with increased resilience for those individuals, right? And resilience is a, is a, is a protective factor as well as related to viewing uh, kind of better Better, a better future in general, including like, you know, access to uh, employment, including education, and a whole bunch of other things. 
that I, I should have prepared, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But if, <laughs> if anybody's interested in what those are, I can email them out later. <laughs> yeah, and, and one thing I do want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Uh, <laughs> yep, exactly. Absolutely. I think um, one thing I'll say is that the like, you know, I think PTSD, right? It originates with the U.S. and specifically veterans, right? So people who are actively engaged, right? military that is trained going into a war zone and then when they came back they had sh they were shell shocked right um, and so i think a lot of western psychology in regards to trauma may not fully capture the experience of those who let's say were not trained in the military right and and so you know i i i'm hesitant to really apply that lens in palestine right but it, people do um there's a ton of research on PTSD symptoms within various pa aspects or parts of the Palestinian population in Gaza, the Gaza Mental Health Program. You know, there's really a lot of research, and I think I think that model may not be the best for for the Palestinian context. Yeah, <laughs> that is a great question. Um, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> you know, I think uh, that's part of what I'm doing uh, right now is trying to figure that out. Um, but I think there's also a, a heavy push away from just like viewing Palestinians and their experiences as traumatic, right? There's tons, tons of uh, great, um, you know, like humor is one great example of like a coping strategy as well as like a, a form of resilience, being able to like laugh at some of the absurdity of, the, of, of what we face, right? And I, I think, I don't know if y'all have seen uh, films by Ilya Suleiman. Um, they will be, I think, on Netflix. So really great films. Um, and, and to me, they're my favorite because they just, they, they're so absurd, but they're also so true, right? They have like, in one scene, <laughs> they have a tank in front of someone's home and the resident of the home, they're under curfew, but they want to take the trash out. So they just walk out and throw the trash and the whole while the tank is like moving. It's, uh, I don't know what you call that, <laughs> right? Turret. Turret, thank you, you know? And, and this is true to our experience. I mean, in, during the second intifada, I remember when a tank got stuck in our neighborhood, you know, for days. They, they were struggling to get out and in because, you know, things are tight and, you know, small roads, and, and at the same time, we were under curfew, and when the tank got stuck there, we were hosting, like, 50 people playing cards and, like, making baking, and, like, it was like a party, but we were under siege, right? So, like, similarly, I'll, I guess another story similar to that, I was coming back from um, South Korea from a conference uh, where we, Jessica and I were actually presenting research, and, uh, and I had to go through the through the bridge, right? And I'm man, I fly into I'm man, and then I have to go to the Alembi crossing or the King Hussein bridge. And I got there on a Sunday at like two with plenty of time. It doesn't close until like eight or nine. So I was like, okay, I think I, I, I should be able to make it. That's great. So I get there and I'm waiting for hours and hours and hours. After four hours of waiting, they decided, okay, we're gonna cut it close. You know, we're done today. We've, uh, I don't know, they come up with weird excuses, either malfunctioning or some sort of holiday or, or like we've le reached our quota. And this is the only entrance for three and a half million Palestinians to the international world, right? And it's open on Fridays and Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. or, you know, within an hour or two, they kind of shift, right? So that of itself is a huge issue. But they closed it down that day. And fortunately, I had bought a towel when I was in Korea, and uh, we were all sent out, you know, I think probably 300 or so Palestinians waiting to cross, families and children and some young men and, you know, things like that. 
and, uh, and it was dark, and it was, uh, it was during Ramadan, right? So everybody was hungry and, and thirsty, and it was, you know, in the middle of this heat. Like, it was, uh, I think, probably 115 during the day or something. And so when I tried to lay down on the street, the asphalt was too hot to actually lay flat on, right? So that's why I was grateful I had the towel. But within an hour of us going back onto the street, and, and mind you, there are no hotels, no, no inns, no, like this is just for the border. And Palestinians are just going through to cross here. Um, and so, you know, we're all pretty much stranded. If you wanted to pay like $100 to get back to Amman to get a hotel or something, you could. But, you know, Palestinians are not the best off economically. And so it turned into, a, really it was a beautiful thing. It turned into kind of a street festival. You know, you had hundreds of Palestinians just hanging out on the street. Some of them pulled out their hookahs. Others were barbecuing. And, and uh, I had a ukulele, so we were, like, singing along and doing things. You know, and, yeah, I think those are the things I, I really like to focus on, right? The, this, this creative kind of resistance, right? In spite of, like, having most things out of our control, we can, we can together enjoy our company and... and and <laughs> sing songs, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's a that's a great. Um, <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of hassle. Um, you know, it's it's a bit challenging within uh, the academic setting. Um, you know, we've had uh, a decent amount of, like, conflict within my department, specifically about Palestine and, and like, various uh, research and things like that. But, but overall, I think, I think we're doing okay, or I feel okay. Um, in terms, I am getting support. I, uh, fortunately, I, was, um, I received a fellowship from the university. Um, so that, uh, you know, kind of covers the cost of attending and, and gives me a stipend. Um, but afterwards... You know, it's, it's really up in the air. I'm not confident in the availability of opportunities in Palestine. Um, and so I'm really <laughs> keeping an eye uh, on uh, various grant, uh, like requests for proposals. And there is some funding for like some research and, and work to do there. Um, but at this point, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what exactly it'll look like when I'm back. Um, but I think, It'll be advocacy, organizing, really working within the Palestinian community. I'm a, so my specific field is ecological community psychology. And I'm very interested, um, you know, in, in one aspect, you, you know, the political imprisonment and reintegration into society and like looking at what services and supports are necessary for Palestinians who've experienced such trauma after being released. What can we do? to make sure that they're able to contribute fully to society, right? And there's, there's uh, some research that has suggested that Palestinian prisoners who have been imprisoned have significantly higher rates of uh, domestic abuse, right? Or like perpetrating. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's really sad and, and on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's, uh, you know, there's clear work that needs to be done and kind of framing it as, you know, it's an anti-oppressive, anti-occupation, as well as a feminist issue, right? And really, I'm hoping to, to be a part of transforming kind of our society in response to the occupation. Uh, we were discussing kind of youth and, and how the majority of Palestinian youth really just want to leave, right? They, they want to live their lives. They want to be able to be happy and do things regular people do. Um, and so... I hope we can figure out a way to let that happen, right? Interesting one to close with. Two, two quick, well, they're not quick questions. <laughs> I'm going to type, ask both of them, and okay. then we'll wrap it up. You, uh, you studied here in the U.S., and so you know this context. What, what are the correlations? Compare and contrast trauma within Palestinian society. Uh, as I mentioned to you over dinner, mm -hmm. uh,
many of us remember when your mom and Amira Haas, the mm -hmm. Har external spoke mm -hmm. from this place. Tell us how your mom's doing, and is she still having to travel in and out and pay the $20,000, mm -hmm. you know, 20,000 shekels? What's her status, mm -hmm. uh, and how's the family? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So maybe I'll start with the question about the compare and contrast. Part of my work at Michigan State was I was uh, an instructor for the Adolescent Diversion Program, which uh, trained undergraduate students to become advocates for youth in the juvenile justice system. And, you know, since I started doing that work, I, I, I just transitioned out of it. Um, but it was really appalling to see to see the parallels of how African American, brown and, black and brown kids in the US are treated by the justice system and see how similar it was to the Palestinian situation, right? To the Israeli imprisonment of Palestinian children. And some of that included, um, you know, children being suspended from school for really absurd things like cleaning the board, right? Um, and the number one predictor of recidivism is contact or previous involvement with the system, right? And so when children are doing things that are getting them referred to the police, like minor things or to the court system, that, you know, is automatically making them extremely likely to recidivize, right? And so part of my work was in, in this advocacy program, um, training undergrads to advocate for the youth. And what that means is like interrupting the school to prison pipeline, right? If they notice that they're being expelled and suspended and referred to police for like absurd things, they, they actually reach out and, you know, work with like the ACLU um, or looking at the policies and tell the principals and teachers, like, I see that this is actually against the policy and this is wrong. And, uh, and that has helped, but also getting resources. I mean, um, you know, homelessness is a huge issue in Lansing, um, especially for youth involved with the courts, as well as mental health, right? Uh, so in terms of the parallels, let me think, where, where do I want to go with this? The part that also, like, is absurd to me. So with COVID, one of the, the things that came up is youth going to court because their family couldn't afford to have internet, and so they were considered truant. So children being in the court system, because they don't at attend school, because their family couldn't afford to have internet for the kids to join through Zoom, right? And you'd think that's something that someone would catch, right? And I don't know if it's by design or intentional, but the system is flawed and the system is broken, both in the US and in Palestine. And, and we need to do more to advocate for these kids. I think um, the other thing is, you know, how people are profiting. From, from this system, right? Their contracts within the Ingham County court system, their contracts to have a certain number of kids go through various, you know, court partners. And if they don't, there could be potentially fines or other consequences. And so they're really incentivized to continue pushing kids into the court system, right? Because if there are no kids, there's no system. And, and that is very closely aligned to you know, the military industrial complex between the US and Israel, right? Um, so much money is going to Israel for military aid and 100% uh, and of that is a contract to buy back from the US certain military companies and then those companies are you know, doing great, uh, making a lot of money and decide to support the Congress folk who are making the decision to send the money to Israel. <laughs> Just like a, a cycle, right? And the same thing within the US and it's really startling and, and so one of the things like learning about this and engaging in this resistance and, and especially like looking at anti-racism uh, anti and uh, trying to address racism as an institutional issue is, um, I've, you know, it's clear that working for justice in the U.S. is going to have a positive impact on justice in Palestine. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you for that reminder. And, uh, you know, a similar example is that, like, many police departments throughout the U.S. are actually trained in Israel or by Israeli officials. And that includes the state of Michigan's, uh, you know, the state police, um, and I, you know, Detroit, Chicago, uh, Fort Wayne. Oh, yeah. Indianapolis. Absolutely. Yeah. So, like, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And so I think addressing that and targeting like militarism in the US, anti-blackness in the US, right? Addressing injustice in the US is gonna have a positive impact on the struggle for justice in Palestine. I mean, you know, uh, for me, you know, the money that's invested in, in this, this system of oppression, in the occupation, it's, it's a lot of money. And, uh, you know, people could have quality universal health care in the U.S. Like, let's divert those funds. <laughs> oh, yes. And, and now the part about my family and my mother, she is currently in Palestine. Um, they have actually extended her stay. There, there were some uh, changes in leadership in those that make those decisions around uh, the reunification process. Um, but the, things are still up in the air, right? Trying to figure out, like, how can I actually come and stay and go as I please, right? Like, not to be subjected to, you know, every three months you have to leave. Or, you know, if they give extensions, it's usually a year or less, right? Your mom was doing that for the length of how long yeah. they For how long have they been? I think 30, 31 years, so your right? Mom has been leaving and coming back mm -hmm. every three months yep. for those 30 years. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's one of more than 200,000 families that have that situation, right? And, and I will say, like, growing up, there were many times where she left and they wouldn't let her back, right? And it would be a question. You know, it would be days and days and sometimes weeks trying to figure out how do we get my mother back home, right? Um, for the wedding, yes. She did make it, fortunately. Um, it, was, it was a nightmare of a process. Uh, you know, I think it was a lot of going to Jordan and then going to the border, the, the bridge, waiting and then being told, okay, today we'll let you in, waiting for eight hours, 10 hours, and then being sent back, like, oh, I'll come back tomorrow, maybe. Then we'll see. And, uh, and she was forced to actually pay a retainer of, uh, I believe it was $20,000, around 70,000 shekels, and, uh, and so if she s stayed like one day more or s violated any sort of uh, like any of the requirements or whatever they decided, um, you know, that money is gone, right? And, and so we'll see what happens, um, but we're working on it. <laughs> Let's say thank you to Lucas. Yeah, thank you.